please ask everyone to rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. champions for 2016-2017. This year we have seven individual state champions and one team champion that we will honor. First, from Parkway West, the girls track team, the 4 by 8 squad. Ladies, come on down, please. This is a two-mile relay. Each girl ran two laps. They had a winning time of 9 minutes and 34 seconds, point nine three. They went by over 3 seconds, which is about 20 feet, so that's a large distance. Uh, team members include Tess Allgaier, <laughs> sophomore, Emily Dixon, a junior, Natalie Butler, sophomore, and Chloe Hirschnow, a sophomore. They were history champions with a time of 10.04. They were sectional champions with a time of 9.39, so knocked off almost 20 seconds. And then at the state meet, they won with a time of 9.34.93. And they're all coming back next year, so we're super excited. Congratulations to the Fort Wayne State Champions. We have two hurdlers from the track team, so we're going to bring them down both at the same time. So if we could have Jaquiel Suber and Jelani Williams, come on down, please. First, Jaquiel Suber. Jaquiel is a junior and won the 300 meter hurdles with a time of 37.93. He also finished second in the 110 hurdles. He also finished fifth in the 4x4, four four, running the anchor leg, and he also finished second in the 4x1 meter relay. So he's a four-time All-State athlete this year at North, and only a junior. Congratulations. He also competed nationally last week, I believe, in an event in New Mexico, and placed seventh in a national bid in the hurdles, so congratulations. We have Jelani Williams. Jelani is only a sophomore. He won the 110 hurdles with a time of 14.26, edging out his teammates by one tenth of a second. So North with one two at the state meet. Pretty amazing. He also was a member of the 4x1 meter relay, which placed second at state. He also was a member of the 4x2, which placed third, and he placed 11th in the high jump. So as a sophomore, he competed in four events at the state meet, which is truly outstanding. He also was a basketball player, also was a member of the football team, played in the state semifinals at Parkway North, had a great year. Only a sophomore, he presently has 11 Division I football offers. So congratulations <laughs> to the and John Lewis. Over on the floor, Mike Barrett, their head coach, Jeff Kinney. Congratulations, coach. from Parkway Central, a senior swimmer, Madison Brown. Madison, come on down. <laughs> Madison was a state champion in the 100-yard backstroke with a winning time of 58.06. She also placed 
seventh in the 100-yard butterfly, so she's a two-time All-State champion this year. Uh, she's been a four-year varsity swimmer at Parkway Central. Last year, she was also All-State. She helped lead her team to an eighth-place finish at State this year, and she will be swimming in college at Missouri State University next year in Springfield, Missouri. So congratulations, Madison. She was coached by Ms. Jen Mocker. Next, from Parkway South, Carson Haskins. Come on down, Carson. We've actually done this quite a few times already with Carson. Carson is only a junior, but he was a state singles champion for Parkway South. What an honor. He finished with a record of 19-0 this year, first place in the class two. He defeated Carson Gates from Staley High School, the same opponent he defeated last year. He has a career record of 69 wins and zero losses. He's a three-time state champion already for Parkway South. He has competed in 138 sets in high school. He has won 138 sets, setting a state record for consecutive wins only after three years. Um, he is the second year in a row that he's the St. Louis Post-Dispatch Metro College, uh, Metro Tennis Player of the Year. Uh, he's a national high school All-American, and in the 88 years of tennis in Missouri, only one other athlete has had the opportunity to win four state titles. Obviously, we don't want to put any pressure on him, but he's well on his way, so good luck next year. And that was over 30 years ago that happened, so truly, this is a historical uh, athlete and moment for Parkway. So uh, this college choice is, uh, is still on the side, but includes Illinois, Indiana, and Vanderbilt. His head coach on the far side there is Coach Nick Tenurchis. Coach, thanks for everything you've done this year, and congratulations to our state champion, again, Carson Haskins from Parkway South. Congratulations. We have our team awards. If I could please have the Parkway Central Volleyball team come on down, please, to the front. They won the Class 3 state championship this year with a record of 32 wins and 4 losses. This is the second state title for head coach Tom Schaefer, third in school history. They were co-conference champions this year along with Pattonville. They won the Cape Notre Dame Tournament. They were district champions defeating Oakville. Uh, so let me introduce the individual team members right now. So gentlemen, when I call your name, you can just kind of step forward, please, and give us a little wave. First, number one, Saeed Ali Kazmi, a senior. Number two, Daniel Roman, a junior. Number three, Lawson Cockerham, a junior. Number four, Matt DeFroger, a junior. Number five, Leah Lerner, a junior. Senior, I'm sorry. Number six, Sam Pennant, a junior. Number seven, Jacob Morton, senior. Number eight, Daniel Buffum, junior. Number nine, Matthew Day, junior. Number 10, Jake Demolowski, a junior. Number 11, Zach Horesco, a senior. Number 12, Jack Meyer, a junior. Number 14, Charlie Meyer, a sophomore. Number 15, Nick Arkachevsky, a junior. And lastly, a senior, number 16, Jalen Scales. Ironically, our two captains are not here. They're actually competing in a national event. The two captains are Daniel Buckham. He's a first-team All-State as a junior. And the other captain was Zach Horesco as a senior. Zach was first-team All-State. Zach was the MVP of the state tournament. Zach is the first-team All-Metro. Zach is a Parkway Central Scholar athlete. He will be playing volleyball next year at New Jersey Institute of Technology. So congratulations to the 2017 Class 3 Volleyball State Champions of Parkway Central Coles. Great job.
As we're going through, I would also like to recognize all the parents of our state champions with us tonight. So if you could please stand. All the parents of our state champions, please stand. Thank you for your support and encouragement. Not sure if I mentioned this. Head coach was Tom Schaefer. Coach Schaefer, congratulations. We're not only proud of our state champions for their accomplishments on the field and on the courts and the swimming pools, but we're proud of them for being great leaders in their schools. Good luck to our seniors next year in college, and we look forward to watching our underclassmen compete next year in Parkway. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Next, I'd like to call Dr. Patrice Age, principal from South High, who will introduce our presidential scholar and our distinguished teacher. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Good evening. Okay, it is with great honor that I introduce to you Aaron Neely from South High. Aaron, will you please come on up? selected as one of two 2017 U.S. Presidential Scholars from Missouri, one of the nation's highest honors for high school students. Aaron is one of only 161 outstanding American high school seniors who have demonstrated outstanding academic achievement, artistic excellence, leadership, citizenship, service, and contribution to the school community. The U.S. Presidential Scholars will be honored in Washington, D.C. from June 18th through June 20th, when each honoree will receive a Presidential Scholar medallion. The White House Commission on Presidential Scholars selects scholars based on their academic success, artistic excellence, essays, school evaluations, and transcripts, as well as evidence of community service, leadership, and, dem leadership and demonstrated commitment to high ideals. Created in 1964, the U.S. Presidential Scholarship Program has honored more than 7,000 of the nation's top performing students with the prestigious award given to the honorees during the annual ceremony in Washington, D.C. Aaron's science teacher, Mr. Joust, was named a U.S. Presidential Scholar Program Distinguished Teacher. Aaron selected Mr. Joust for recognition. Is he with us too? As he didn't get to make it. Aaron will be attending Emory University with a probable major in chemistry and a minor in classics or Spanish. She plans to attend medical school. Congratulations, Aaron. Mr. Jeff Lackey, Coordinator of Fine Arts, who's going to present the recognition for our All-State Jazz and Thespian students. Good evening, President Beth Feldman, members of the school board, Dr. Marty and Ms. Stover, and all others present this evening. It is with great honor that I introduce six extremely talented and dedicated Parkway High School musicians who have achieved the honor of having been selected to perform in the 2017 all-State Vocal Jazz Ensemble in Jefferson City, Missouri at the, their Choral Directors Convention this July. The All-State Choir is an audition group of 16 of the very best jazz singers in Missouri. The students' applicants range from anywhere from juniors in high school all the way through seniors in college. Of the 16 available spots, Parkway students filled five of those spots plus one alternate meaning Parkway students represent nearly one-third of this year's All-State Ensemble. I want to thank their music teachers for motivating, nurturing, and guiding these students into the skilled, accomplished musicians they are today. Parents, we'd also like to take the time to thank you for your continuing support and guidance. I would now like to introduce the All-State Jazz Choir students that are here tonight by school and were to be recognized by the Parkway Board of Education and Dr. Marty. Not able to be here tonight was North High Jordan Patterson Soprano. And then from West High, we have June Bain, tenor. I didn't get a list of who was here. We have Katia Frederick, alto. 
We have Ma Mason Todd Barito. Okay, we have two more. We have Mitchell uh, Veerling Tenner and Caroline Vogel Soprano. Were any of them able to come here? All right. <laughs> So it is now with great honor I introduce six other extremely talented and dedicated Parkway High School theater students who have been achieved the distinction of having been selected to perform in this past year's Missouri All-State show, which was called Ephene I'm gonna say this wrong, Ephigenia. These students auditioned a year in advance and were selected out of hundreds of students from across the state of Missouri. After being selected to be part of the show, they committed to rehearsal, they were committed to rehearsals from April through January to prepare for the performance that took place before an appreciative audience of theater educators, administrators, and parents at the Missouri State Thespian Conference. I want to thank their teachers for their nurturing, motivating, and guiding the students along with their parents as well for their support along the way. I, if we can introduce them, I do know these are here tonight. We have from Central High, uh, Alita Baston, Emily King, and Jonathan Scully. And from North High, we have Andrew Evans. Evan was a cast member in the show. Nick Austin. Nick was on the tech crew. And Mary Carter. Mary also was on the tech crew for the show. Again, we want to congratulate our All-State here. Next, I'd like to call Jenny Prophet, High School Coordinator for STEM, and Courtney Yeager, Middle School Coordinator for Social Studies and Communication Arts. Thank you. Good evening, President Feldman, members of the board, Dr. Marty Mistover, and all the other parents and community members present this evening. We want to first begin by thanking the administrators, the teachers, and parents of these students for their support and guidance in nurturing and developing their skills and talents. The first recognition is specific to middle school social studies, but these students truly took on an interdisciplinary project. Ms. Lorenz, would you come down as well? Would the following students from West Middle come forward to shake our board members' hands, and as you do so, I will explain their accomplishments. Um, first of all, we have Carl Oswald and Catherine Rain, and they could not be here tonight, but also Arden Dixon and Sarah Fracci. These students... These students worked after school and on the weekends to participate in the Missouri History Day state competition. Thank you. Student participants conducted extensive research on a historical subject of their choice and present findings their way by creating documentaries, exhibits, performances, or websites. Over 3,000 Missouri students participate in local and regional competitions each year, and some advance to the state contest at the University of Missouri in April. These students, under the direction of West Middle teacher Chris Lorenz, play second in the junior group documentary division for Under the Stars of a Star, Sybil Ludington's story. Sybil was a 16-year-old female, Paul Revere, for her community. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we have the Scholastic Writing Awards. The Scholastic Writing Awards are a national competition, and gold key winners from Missouri advance to the next level. This competition has 11 categories, from flash fiction to critical essay, and students can submit writing in the genre of their choice. Gold key, silver key, and honorable mention awards are distributed in each category, and winners are invited to the Scholastic Writing Awards ceremony at Tantara Resort in Osage Beach in February. We will start with the middle school awards. I want to thank their teachers for sharing these award-winning pieces with me. Students, as I call your name, please come forward to shake our board members' hands, and as you do, I will describe a little bit about your piece. First, Sarah Boland from West Middle. Woo! 
Sarah received an honorable mention in the category of short story for her piece titled The Escape. This clever short story is the tale of an escape artist named Copper, told entirely from the point of view of Copper the dog. As a reader, I appreciated how Sarah artistically wove the narrative of the internal dialogue of the dog, foiled against the dialogue and reactions of the peoples. Sarah's ELA teacher was Emma Bauman. Congratulations. Next, we have Sharuti Panda from West Middle. Sharuti. Sharuti received an honorable mention in the category of humor for her piece titled Pandemonium. To read about this roller coaster ride is to feel dizzy alongside the writer and laugh with the writer. As a reader, I appreciated how Sharuti evoked enough emotion that it caused me to smile and experience the ride along with the narrator throughout this piece. Sharuti's ELA teacher was Emma Bauman. Next, we have Ahmad Rafiq. Ahmad received a Silver Key Award for his short story, The Match. Ahmad's short story took me on an imaginative and descriptive journey engaged in dialogue in which a magic match holds power, too much power. The story expertly built a dynamic character that Ahmad used to reveal the theme. Congratulations. Our last middle school award winner is Brenda Amble from West Middle. Brenda received a gold key award for her personal essay titled, Why Can't I? As a reader, I really appreciated how this piece not only explores moments of the intensity of a particular race with sophisticated descriptive language, but gently unfolds the theme around doubt that is often cast onto female athletes. Brenda's ELA teacher was Emma Bauman. Central High School writers also did extremely, extremely well in the 2017 Scholastic Writing Contest. If you're here, please come forward. Kayla Benjamin for the personal essay titled Changing the World Around Me. Sardef Gadat Ghosh for his personal essay titled Reality Check. Josie Anat for the personal essay titled Friends Without Benefits. Zava Neem for the personal essay titled Stolen Safe Place. Maddie Scannell for the personal essay titled Escaping the Echo Chamber. Jake Schwartz for the personal essay titled The Sewer of Years Prior. Jessica Sun for the personal essay titled Game Changer. Athena Stamos for the personal essay titled Jump In. <laughs> Shoshona Weinstein for the personal, tit personal titled The Great Gumball Fiasco. And Abby Wilner for the personal titled Action and Assumption. We also had several students win the Scholastic Writing Silver Key Award. Tony Chin for the personal essay titled Grab My Hand. Chloe Grant for the personal essay titled Far, Far Away from the Stress. James Kim for the humor piece titled The First Kiss. And KISS stands for Kissing is Such Stress. <laughs> Elena Wilner for the personal essay titled What to Do When You Don't Know What to Do. <laughs> we are also very excited to recognize one Scholastic Writing Gold Key winner for high school for her personal essay titled All the World's a Stage and Other Theatrical Clichés, and that's Emily Kane. For the poetry out loud winner, that's Emily Bauer from West High. Okay, for the second year in a row, this Parkway student claimed the title of Missouri State Champion in the Poetry Out Loud winner competition. West High's Emily Bauer, coached by Miss Andrea Ben Bubar, yeah, earned this amazing honor after winning both her school and regional competition. <laughs> she went on to perform exceptionally well at the national competition in Washington, D.C placing in the top nine in the country.
Sam Lopinski here from Central Mill. Okay, let me tell you about Sam. Um, Sam was the state champion in the Letters About Literature competition. His piece was recently judged at the national level, and he received a national honor award as a runner-up, which means out of all 50 state first place winners, his piece was in the top three. Wow. Yeah, pretty good. So Letters About Literature is a reading and writing contest for students in grades 4 through 12, sponsored by the Library of Congress. Students are asked to read a book, poem, or speech, and write to the author, living or dead, about how the book affected them personally. Letters are then judged at the state and national level. Tens of thousands of students from across the country enter this competition each year. Sam wrote a powerful and personal letter to Sharon Draper, thanking her for writing Out of My Mind. His letter explained how the story helped him build empathy for how hard his sister works to do things that many of us probably take for granted, for how much his parents work to ensure his sister has a voice, and for how important it is for he and his peers to recognize that a little kindness goes a long way. All right, next we have the 2017 State and National Speech and Debate Champions. Um, so first, um, we had uh, students who qualified from both Central and West High School. They both have strong debate teams with winners at both the district and the state level. And they'll actually be heading to the national competition next week. So students from Central High, actually coached by Rob Profit, um, are speech and debate award winners. Emily Fow, who took sixth place in radio broadcasting at the state competition. Daniel Berkovich and Clarinda Tan, who placed fourth in public forum debate at district. They also qualified for the national competition but are unable to attend. We have Ariella Mahoney and Abby Flynn. Ariella and Abby took first place in duet acting at the state competition this year, and Ariella was also the first place winner in dramatic interpretation at district, and she will compete in the event at national next week. And then we have Maddie Scannell and Jennifer Hyman. Maddie and Jennifer are two-time national qualifiers. They placed ninth in the country last year in public forum debate. They're also three-time state qualifiers. They finished third for two years, and then this year they were the state runners-up. Um, after taking first place in districts, Maddie and Jennifer will be returning to national next week. From West High, that's coached by Mrs. Kira Borgsmiller, we have also several award winners, um, Cheryl Ma and Ryan O'Connor. Cheryl and Ryan placed third in public forum debate as, duo, as a duo at districts. They will compete in nationals next week. Cheryl and Ryan double qualified. Cheryl placed second at districts and will compete also in the program oral interpretation and Ryan will compete in oratory. Then we have Adita Booty, Jesse Calvert, Peter Patev, and Liza Tarakanova. World Schools Debate for the district level. They've been selected to represent the Eastern Missouri in World Schools Debate at Nationals next week. Jesse Calvert also placed third in poetry reading at the state level this year. <laughs> next we have our 2017 Publication Awards. This includes newspaper, journalism, and yearbooks. Um, we have a very rich tradition in this district of producing, <laughs> producing nationally rec recognized journalism publications. The following students from West High had stories selected as part of the National Best of School Newspaper Online Publication. Carly Anderson, Sydney Kinsey, Justin Cups, Samantha Gaddis, Bridget Noonan, Maddie Hoffman, Nell Jaskowiak, and Hannah Hoffman. Journalism Convention write-off competition. There were some West High students who also earned an honorable mention. They are Danny Fisher from Newspaper Review Writing, Paloma Gonzalez for Yearbook Academics Copy and Captions, and Ashley Spillman for Yearbook Student Life Copy and Captions. Journalism Convention write-off competition.
competition, these West High students earned a rating of excellence. We have Nell Jaskowiak for newspaper editorial writing, Kaylee Tippelman for yearbook cover and end sheet design, Olivia Ryman for yearbook club copy and captions, and Sydney Kinsey for newspaper feature writing. students earned the top ranking of the Superior Award at the National High School Journalism Convention write-off competition. From North High, we have Anna Arnold for yearbook student life copy and captions. From West High, Casey Berg for yearbook sports copy and captions. And then also from North High, Mercedes Nesbitt for the newspaper photo Boy Scouts at the Homecoming Parade. This year's West High newspaper staff, who's advised by Ms. Deborah Clevins, and in which many of the students just recognized are part of, also earned the National Scholastic Press Association All-American rating with five marks of distinction, and they took sixth place Best of Show Award at the Seattle National Journalism Competition. The West High yearbook staff also took home some top national awards this year for last year's yearbook the Best of Show Award at the Indianapolis National Journalism Convention, the National Scholastic Press Association All-American Rating with four marks of distinction, the Columbia University Scholastic Press Association Gold Crown Award, and the National Peacemaker Award. The National Pacemaker Award is considered the highest national honor in the field. It is unofficially known as the Pulitzer Prize of Student Journalism. So. Any parents that are here of these students tonight, so if you're a parent, if you could please stand up so we can recognize you too. Okay, sleeping on the job. I'd like to call Dr. Chelsea Watson, Assistant Superintendent of Services who's going to present the Schools of Character and Champions of Character. and social studies classes, 
and they learned about composting and soil composition in science class. Students from the technical education class built garden beds, and all students took part in planting the beds funded by the garden center. The Diggett Garden Club and each advisory also played an important role. After hearing from the director of a local food pantry about the needs of their clients, students in Dr. Ribeiro's health classes organized a flat, fresh food drive. Students researched food, designed the campaign, promoted the food drive, and weighed in the food. It was the first of its kind for the food pantry and was a great success with over 3,700 pounds collected. Congratulations, Southwest Middle School. <laughs> Next, I'll recognize Oak Brook Elementary School. Staff from Oak Brook and students, come on down. want to see in the world. The staff, the parents, and students try to live this every single day at Oak Brook. They implement service learning into the curriculum throughout the year. And throughout this past school year, teachers, parents, students, community members, they did a lot to share their passion for helping to serve the community and others. This school year, many events were, were held. I'm just going to share a couple because there were many great things that happened at Oprah this year. Parents added to the annual spirit night this year by including a dump tank and food trucks to benefit <laughs> Officer Flanagan, right? Baldwin police officer who was shot in the line of duty. Students who participated in Girls on the Run worked together as they learned about helping the community and making themselves stronger. They researched and completed a service project to help the family of Officer Blake Schneider, local police officer who lost his life while serving. Students participated <laughs> in the money war and raised over $2,100 for this family. Parents and staff worked collaboratively in the garden club. Students, parents, and staff created a community vegetable garden. The cafeteria manager helped students harvest various types of lettuce from the indoor tower garden, and the lettuces served in the cafeteria for all to eat during lunchtime. And during the summer, families are also able to harvest fresh produce as well. Please congratulate Oak Brook Elementary School champions.
the Growing Leaders Tree, which encompasses the school's commitment to every member making character education lead all they do. You can immediately witness students and staff carrying out their school job. So this tree is not just a poster on the wall, but it's a way of doing school at Carmen Trails Elementary. A parent, Mr. Backer, at Carmen Trails shared, the staff isn't just a staff that does what they need to do to get by. They don't let time constrictions get in their way. And even when they aren't on contract, they do what needs to be done because they care. The evaluators ask students what they want to be when they grow up and which of the character traits they felt would help them most. Jackie, one of the students, said, I want to be a teacher because of the character trait integrity. She said, it's important to do the right thing when nobody's watching and to help and be kind and nice to kids. Please join me in recognizing Carmen Trails Elementary School as a Missouri and national school of character.
She was scheduled to talk to students and observe South Talks. The feedback report from Northeast Middle received that they received highlighted some of the experiences she had during her visit. She talked to the parent who had children in Parkway for 12 years. She noted that the parent became emotional as she was describing how Northeast Middle has changed, sharing that one of the improvements is the feeling that, quote, they are all worth something. The evaluator also highlighted the caring community of Northeast, noting the amazing relationships students have with, for example, the school resource officer, and the students leading the work around restorative practices, leading circles, and so many other activities. She also wrote about the meaningful and challenging curriculum being taught at Northeast. She noted how teachers are developing experiences that are contemporary and engaging. One of the teachers talked to the evaluator and said, I love this school. It's home for a lot of students. It's home for me. The evaluator wrote about her conversation with an eighth grader who happened to be Jada in one of her student guides. Jada gave her an assessment of the school that matches her observations and it seemed fitting to write them in the report. The evaluator wrote, Jada said there are three things that make the school great. One, character. It doesn't matter how smart you are if you're not a good person. Two, learning. Learning beyond books, learning from your mistakes. We may not have the top test scores, but we have the best learners. We learn from our mistakes, we learn about other cultures and the world and things we are concerned about. We can have uncomfortable conversations. And three, taking risks. This school really teaches you to speak up and use your voice. Please join me in congratulating Northeast Middle School. Our next school is Southwest Middle School. Will the team join me again? The evaluator began her feedback by writing, Southwest Middle is a big school, and its modern spaciousness struck me right away as I entered the building. A parent who recently moved to the district from Kansas City shared with her, walking in, the wow of the schoolyard and the way they incorporate the outside and inside is very noticeable, especially if you come from a box school. But the evaluator continued, saying, as I walked through the halls and talked to students and staff, I quickly realized that Southwest is so much more than a pretty, pretty place. The sense of caring and respect is everywhere. An eighth grader shared with the evaluator, we live by our core values. Respect is the most important one, but I never go a day without compassion. I truly felt a sense of ethical learning, said the evaluator. She said community. The community is committed to character education everywhere I went to school, no matter who I talked to. She noted that the school's theme this year was unlocking your potential. She said that she believes that that contributed to students' focus on persistence because students talked about being on their path to the future. She said, I saw engaged learning in every classroom I visited. The strong work ethic is not just evident with the students, but with the teachers too. Please join me in recognizing Southwest Middle School as a Missouri school and a national school. Next, we will recognize the Parkway School District as a Missouri district and national district of character. In the evaluator's first paragraph of her feedback, she wrote, 
When I was assigned to evaluate the Parkway School District, I first made a call to Dr. Marvin Berkowitz. Since he teaches late, the Leadership Academy for Character Education in St. Louis, he knows the schools in that area very well. He told me, you'll like Parkway. They are doing many good things, and I found that to be very true. Our evaluator noted the many academic accolades, Blue Ribbon Schools, U.S. News and World Report. But she wrote, while these recognitions are notable, having five national schools of character out of 28 is only about 20% of the district. How should I determine if the district itself is worthy of the honor? National District of Character, she wrote. Our evaluator wrote about Parkway's engagement process and seeking input and feedback as we began the strategic process of talking about character education in 2012 to our most recent listening tours. It was noted that our work around restorative practices and the many school diversity cultural events plays a key role in helping Parkway students become better citizens. During the visit, she spoke with Luke, a student at South High, and she was intrigued at South Talks and the open spaces that students had to discuss diversity and contemporary issues. She also highlighted a few parent comments. One parent, who happens to now be on our school board, Mr. Todd, she cited that he is a Parkway alum and PTO president at West High and said his kids have attended several different Parkway schools and he commented on how well the school makes kids aware of the world around them. Many of the teachers who also coach spend from 6.30 to 7.15, several days a week working on building character traits. Teachers truly care about preparing students for life, said Mr. Todd. He also commented on the district and its constant striving to improve. He praised the professional development efforts and stated they give teachers tools beyond books. Another parent, Ms. Spivey, said character is embedded in the multi-grade level family and integrated through kindness like confetti. Just last week we received two texts on the kindness that my kids have done. And in the place for character on the report cards, it shows that they really know my kids. Now, if you remember earlier I said the evaluator had some wonderings about Parkway based on having just a handful of national schools of character. In conclusion, our evaluator noted, and I discovered that although only five schools have been named National Schools of Character to date, more will probably receive the designation this year, and many more are on their character journey. So it seems like that character.org will continue to accredit more schools from Parkway down the road. She further stated, based on her review of our website, the application, the school visits, that she could feel Parkway is devoted to developing students in both academics and character development. So, who do we want to recognize here? I have to recognize, first and foremost, I was going to say, Dr. Erin Schultz, <laughs> our coordinator. <laughs> five years ago and has put her heart and soul into working and helping us continue to develop the character of our students. She also led the writing team as part of the character education action team in writing this application. If we have other members of the character ed action team, would you please join Erin here at the podium? from Oak Brook who arrived to be recognized for their work around championing careers. So students, can you come and shake the hands of the board members to be recognized for your great work? <laughs>
Let's give these students another round of applause. For their as a district of character, you, each and every one of you in this room, need to be acknowledged for your work. It's you, Dr. Marty. It's you, board member. It's you, parents and students and administrators and teachers and counselors. It's you that makes this district a national district of character. So, turn to your partner and give your partner or your shoulder partner a high five Say, great job, well done. So let's continue developing the whole child, meeting their academic, social, and emotional needs. And we will continue doing what's right for our community and for our country. Thank you. to the last award of the night, I want to say, Dr. Watson, I know you don't do what you do for recognition, but I'd just like to take a moment to recognize your efforts since um, you became Assistant Superintendent of Student Services. The enormous growth of the work in character education in Parkway could not have been possible without your efforts. And now, Dr. Keith Marty. First of all, uh, congratulations everyone, thanks for hanging in there. We just have one more for recognition. And I would like uh, Paul Candy and the communications uh, folks to join me, including Amy Story. Please, all of you come down here. This is Kathy Kelly, Amy Story, and Annie Dickerson, and Paul Candy. As they're coming, let me uh, share with you that uh, they were a little reluctant about being recognized, but uh, really the award that they are being recognized for is uh, a, a bit like the Oscar or the Emmy in, uh, in another, another field. This is a, a, an amazing award. For more than 45 years, the Bronze Anvil Awards have celebrated the best of the best in public relations tactics, <coughs> not just in public education, but more broadly. The individual items or components that contribute to the success of overall program or campaigns. These tactics, whether in the media relations program, website, annual report, podcast, blog, or other use of social media, are the hardworking parts of any successful public relations program. Parkway's communications department recently received the 2017 Bronze Anvil Award of Commendation for the HOPE chalkboard. Do you remember that? The HOPE chalkboard. How many of you saw the HOPE chalkboard? If you haven't, it's still out there, right? for people to see. This was a, a start of the year with students and staff at Southwest Middle School. This year's competition for this uh, Anvil Award drew a total of 564 entries. Of those, only 94 organizations were selected for the Bronze Anvil uh, judges at the Bronze Anvil Award of Accommodation winners. This demonstrates the high standards supplied to judges in their evaluation progress. Now, why this is so rare and why we need to celebrate it is that the competition, the people or other entities that won this award, listen to these uh, organizations or entities. The University of Michigan, Bank of America, Home Depot, Wrangler, Allstate Insurance, and Hilton, to name a few, are among the people who also received this award. And I think they have a lot more money to put into <laughs> uh, campaigns in the Parkway School District. So uh, we are very, very proud of our communications department. We know here in Parkway, those of us who work with this department, their wonderful expertise, they, uh, their wonderful innovation, the work that they do. We're missing actually a very important piece of this tonight, and Derek Duncan, who's been an amazing addition as well, and also uh, James Scorberg, who just joined the group. Am I missing anyone? But, uh, besides the four folks here. So um, we have nothing to give them. We don't have the animal to give them yet. But please uh, join me in recognizing our communication for this
students, teachers, administrators, parents, counselors, and everybody else who works to make Parkway District work. Let's give everybody a round of applause. Thank you all for joining us tonight, and we're going to take a break for just a few minutes to give those of you that need to leave an opportunity to do so. Thank you.
Like I said, every time I call, it's either I call you guys or you know you guys or like a message or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like that. <laughs> that's, like, that's the only way I'll reach out to you guys. So it's like, here, I think it's all one time. It's like Gary. All right. Yeah. Big winner. Big winner. Big winner. Oh, thank you, man. Thank <laughs> you. 
13. Prior to her current role at West High, she was with the Rockwood School District as an associate principal at Marquette High School and an assistant principal at Rockwood Summit High School. Prior to that, she was the chair of the English department at McClure North High School. In her current role, Dr. Siebel has been leading intervention work and made, a, and made positive changes in the weekly progress monitoring process at West High. As part of this work, she has facilitated the streamlining of the care team process, allowing a lens of equity to be used when making decisions. She's also led work with staff and students as West High helps students and others understand the views, values, and cultures of others. Feedback from Dr. Siegel's interview were as follows. She is confident and has personality. Her depth with data is strong. She has a passion and belief that all teachers can grow and all students can learn given a positive and caring environment. Dr. Siebel has a sense of the work that has occurred at Northeast Middle School and will honor plans in place and take that building to the next level. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Siebel to her new role. I first just want to say thank you to um, on behalf to Dr. Jeremy Mitchell and to the West Area community um, for challenging me and supporting me to grow into this new role, which I'm very excited to take on. I'm also grateful to Dr. Marty, Dr. Watson, and the Board of Education for believing in me and supporting me into um, this new position as well. Um, and finally, to the Northeast Middle School community, I am so, so impressed with the work that's been going on. Congratulations on everything you've all accomplished to this point. And I look forward to supporting that work and learning and growing alongside it. So thank you very much. The 10.02 calendar meeting, the next regular board meeting, will take place on Wednesday, August 2nd, 2017, beginning at 7 p.m. in Central Middle. An anticipated closed session will be held at 6 o'clock p.m. 10.03, board liaison report. We'll start again and work our way forward. Sunday evening, Dr. Marty hosted a dinner uh, that several of us attended with the Pattonville school board members and two keynote speakers. Um, maybe Dr. Marty can look at this. The, the Fred Brandman? Uh, Fred Bermonte. Bermonte. Uh, former board member of the state board of, uh, in, in New Hampshire, and Ray McNulty, the dean of uh, college education at Southern New Hampshire University. So that, that was a very exciting talk about design challenges with school districts, and we got it of schools and it was just really, I, I can't even begin to tell you how charged up I got after, after that dinner. So I, I really thank you very much for you and the superintendent of Pattonville uh, bringing that together for us. Um, I would just comment on, I got to go on a summer school tour yesterday and um, one particular class that was already elementary was an elementary class on building your own business. Um, and it was teams of kids that were putting together little businesses and they were going to pitch them and have a competition. And there was a lot of glitter, um, but my favorite. 
favorite part of it was that out of, I think, 24 total students, there were 22 girls, which I thought was really cool for an Responders honor and ceremony, uh, and what impressed me the most about it was it was entirely student run. The teachers, staff, uh, they, they really played no role in in executing that event. It was, uh, it was student MC, it was uh, student speakers, uh, and it was a really neat way to honor uh, the first responders that are there uh, at the Ferris community. Uh, also, just in the last month, obviously, I've been able to attend a number of Parkway graduations, uh, but I've also attended probably, probably even more personal graduations. It's been interesting for me to sit through those now as a board member with that, that particular lens and see how we compare to, uh, to high schools conducting a graduation ceremony and, and as we compare to other schools here in the St. Louis area and, and around the country, uh, and it's just, Fascinating to see how we're how we're very different and we're very the same all at the same time. But in the end, we're we're uh, preparing our kids uh, in very unique ways, and it shows. So. Speaking of graduations, after nine years of being on the school board, I finally made it to my last school, which was North High. I had never been to a North High graduation because we had several board members who. Um, who were from that part of the district and they knew so many of the kids so they always attended and now that they're not on the board anymore it was my turn and i have to say how much i enjoyed seeing the personality of north high and seeing the personality of all the schools individually come out in their graduations even though they're in the same place they basically have the same format you can really get a feel for each school's personality as you as you um, sit there during the ceremony so that was really fun and then yesterday i had a wonderful opportunity to attend the central office annual picnic which um, was a really great picnic because it took place indoors on a day that was like 95 degrees uh, but it's always fun to get together with the central office staff and recognize some um, service awards and um, the longest serving employee of that building is tasha who's been with parkway for 25 years and we went all the way down to um, somebody who's been there for five years and there were couple of 20 year award uh, awardees. So that's really exciting. It's really, really amazing how many people in Parkway devote their entire career to our district, so. Can I just add a couple of things? First of all, uh, I just want to say the board has been extremely busy. Uh, we mentioned the retreat and uh, special uh, Sunday night uh, a dinner and graduations. And so thank you, board. Uh, you're going to get a little time off now. We <laughs> Uh, through the summer, but thank you for all your service and defending uh, activities. Uh, Christy and Jeff briefly, uh, we, we toured summer school uh, Tuesday, as Christy mentioned, and I just want to announce that uh, between a regular summer school uh, and then uh, special uh, programs, uh, academies, at least, is that what we call them, academies, they got the Jennifer Stanfield is organized, uh, we have about 9,000 students that will be enrolled in summer school uh, between uh, the regular, I think about uh, 60, 400 kids and then about another 1,700 in the academies uh, throughout the, uh, the summer extending beyond uh, regular summer school time. So that's really a tribute to our, our students and our staff dedicated to that. So we're very proud of the number of students are taking advantage of the extended learning time. And Jennifer Stanfield was in her first summer leading um, our summer efforts. And it's Jennifer, isn't it? I don't think so. Probably the rest of you not because she's been a busy, busy spell for us. So thank you, Mrs. Mills. For board subcommittee reports, there are none. And 10.05 upcoming subcommittee meetings, as Dr. Mari said, we have a little time off, so none. But I do want to say that um, Mr. Todd and Ms. Davis have been very busy attending their um, their board orientation meetings. We just came from one that we had at 4.30 this evening, and we had another one last week. And even as someone who spent a long time learning from you all, I learn something new every day which really makes it fun to be on the school board. So thank you all for sharing what you do every day with board members, we appreciate it. 11.0 action items. We have 68, so I'm gonna start reading now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented in the June 14, 2017 board materials. Is there anything that needs 
Can we call the action or close? Great, then we can vote. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries 5-0. All right, action items 12.01, approval of the 2017-2018 budget. Patty Bedborough, CFO, please come on down and see if somebody's got a question. Good evening, everyone. So that was quite a packet for you all to go through. Um, of course, we did have a summary of everything that's included in the packet in our April board meeting. But certainly, if you have any questions at this time, um, we are here to entertain um, your questions. First of all, a lot of us have prepared in advance of this meeting and reviewing the budget. And I just want to thank you for addressing all of the questions that I had in advance to try to help save uh, the evening's time um, and make it a more efficient board meeting. But we asked questions ahead of time, and so I had a number of questions about very specific things within the budget, and I just want to thank you very much for addressing all of those. Oh, you are so welcome. I did not do that alone. I um, our Director of Finance, Brian Whittle, um, also helped with uh, some of those uh, responses. So you are more than welcome. That is what we are here for. The one, the one, um, when I pulled myself away from the weeds, if you will, and took a, a bigger picture of this, it looks like um, this upcoming year, and I, pardon me if I don't exactly know what page it's on, but I, I noticed that this is the 20, the upcoming year, 2017 to 18, is the, the largest loss that we're going to see in like the past several years and the next upcoming years that's budgeted for a loss. So, but it looks like we're going to be able to recuperate okay, right? For a loss, the only fund that has a loss is the capital projects fund. And that is directly related to the spend down of um, the bond funds. The operating fund has growth and so does the debt service fund. So when you're looking at the total funds and the recapitulation, you do see that the revenues, the total revenues, are less than um, the total expenditures. But that's because we do have capital spending um, projected for the summer of, not only this summer, but then the summer of 2018 as well, for the finishing of the bond project. So in that fund alone, we have 22 million of a, yeah, 22 million 583 of a net spend down in there. So remember, we sell the bonds. Once the bond issue is passed by our voters, mm -hmm. then we have authorization to sell the bonds. And at that point in time, we recognize the revenue. And that stays in the capital fund balance until um, those funds are spent out. Okay, all right, thank you. You guys, it's on page 24. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And on page 23. So. The, the normal capital projects fund also shows a loss, so we are purchasing for the first time in a few years uh, buses. So we're replenishing some of our existing fleet. We're buying 10 new CNG buses and replacing 10 of our diesel fuel buses. Um, but you'll see that that uh, fund is also being infused with a $1.7 million transfer from our operating fund. I think at one point in time, the district levied um, some of our local revenue into uh, into the capital projects fund, and that ceased um, probably in like 2010 or so, in order to help with some of our budget cuts and put as much levy as we could into our operating funds. So, any other questions? Anybody else? Um, so this, this is uh, graduating Patty and, and her department for their work. It uh, used to be that there was kind of a, a three or four month budget season, but now really, as Patty's already thinking about next, the, the 1819 budget, right? Uh, but uh, Nina said, that, I mean, it's an ongoing process. So this is really, a, you know, it's just kind of a celebration and an approval of this budget, but uh, it, we're already thinking ahead. And obviously, you see Patty has projected, uh, you know, out three to five years and trying to do a, and stay as, as focused as we can on, on what the movie targets are. Thanks, Patty. You're welcome. May I have a motion and a second that the Board of Education approve the 2017-2018 expenditure budget as presented by the administration in the amount of $276,567,161 
with $84,295,409 to be expended from the general fund, $148,765,010 from the special revenue fund, and $25,643,042 from the capital projects fund, and $17,863,700 from the debt service fund. So as we um, have gone through the process of revising or looking at our curriculum in our core areas, so English language arts, math, science, and social studies, it has been a condensed process over the last couple of years because of a Missouri state statute that came out of House Bill 14, 19, I do not remember the statute number, um, which with that state statute, Missouri learning standards were changed. We had prior... Prior to the change, Missouri had adopted the Common Core State Standards. And as a part of this state statute, um, there were teacher teams from across the state that rewrote the Missouri learning standards in those four content areas. We have a gradual rollout of when they will impact state achievement tests. So the, the MAP test and the EOC test in the state of Missouri test um, the content in the Missouri Learning Standards. And so we need to adjust our curriculum to ensure that we are aligned with those before the new state assessments or before the assessments change. The first assessments to change are ELA and math. And so that's why um, last at the last board meeting you looked at the um, ELA curriculum and then the, for this board meeting you're looking at the math curriculum. Our coordinators also took this as an opportunity to once again look at our curriculum to ensure uh, and to shore up places where we might not be aligned um, as tightly with our vision statements that we would like to be um, or our embedding of our learning principles, for example, lessons in stage three that come after you approve the curriculum framework. It's also been an opportunity to look at alignment to our character education standards. So um, a state statute nudged us to do this, uh, but we've taken the opportunity to do even more work beyond that. And our three STEM coordinators have worked together um, to ensure that the math curriculum is a K-12 tightly aligned um, curriculum that's aligned to our new state standards and um, along with our character education standards and to ensure that they're working towards our vision statements. And I'm sure they can answer any specific questions about the math curriculum you might have. Again, I, I submitted some questions ahead of time, and thank you very much for addressing those. Um, you did a great job, so I really appreciate having that information ahead of time. Okay. So may I have a motion and second that the Board of Education approve the curriculum revisions for K-12 mathematics presented in the June 14, 2017 board meeting materials. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carried 5-0. 12.03, approval of modern languages level one for math curriculum. Uh, Amy Belding, modern and classical languages curriculum coordinator. Come on down. Last but not least. Does anybody have any, any uh, questions for Ms. Belding? I do just have a couple slides. Sure, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Amy Belding and I coordinate Modern Classical Languages. This is my first year coordinating MCL. I previously coordinated Career and Tech Ed, which I still do along with Choice Program. So, Chad, I'm here to talk with you a little bit about that. So, I, I guess I want to start by saying, with technology, 
technology, our students really have a more an opportunity to connect with students, not only here in our local community, but globally. And I think that because of that, they are really deeply entrenched with this idea of interculturality, even more so than we were when we were studying as students. And so, you know, we ask the question as educators who are preparing students to respond to an ever-changing world, how do we do that? And so one of the avenues that we do that is by encouraging and fostering students learning a language. And so thinking about why we learn a language or how we learn a language has really actually shifted quite a bit. And so although we're offering different languages here in Parkway, we're shifting from more of a content-based model to a competency-based model, which is focused on speaking. And the reason why is probably because when you all were learning a language, it might have looked something like this. And it was about conjugating verbs, worksheets, and vocabulary. And a generation of research around neuroscience has shown that we have a large gap of people in the United States that took anywhere from two to five years of language and are not, in fact, fluent in that. And so that research has really propelled the people in the world language world to do research around what are best practices in learning a language. And what they found is that it is around communication. And so our MCL teachers uh, last summer um, began the journey to rewrite our curriculum, specifically in level one, around a content and competency-based model that fosters that transfer of speaking that skill. So part of the reason of the why that we do that as well is because students and adults as well are learning technology on, or learning languages through technology. Um, Babbel or Zeta Stone, Duolingo, or just a few companies that offer online language learning. Duolingo has grown to 170 million users in the past five years. So we know that technology has to be a part of what we're doing and that content can't solely live in a textbook for our students that are learning those languages. So our teachers, again, have really engaged in this deep work around what does it look like to actually speak a language, how do we encourage our teachers to speak 90% in the target language, even in our seventh grade classes, and how does that kind of trickle up. And I just have a short video from ACTFL. ACTFL um, is our national association that has really done a ton of research around learning of a language, and it's a four minutes, we're gonna show maybe two and a half, so we'll go ahead and see that in the video. Learning languages prepares us to connect in the multilingual and multicultural world we share. Actful and 16 other language organizations collaborated to create So we teach language beginning in sixth grade through our Future Pathways course, and that is really just an exposure model. And then in seventh grade, students can take Spanish, French, German, Latin, um, uh, what am I missing? American Sign Language in some of our schools. They take it in seventh and eighth grade, then they can get a high school credit. Um, yeah, at that, yeah. Yeah, we've talked about that, these two. Um, certainly, that's something that um, I know Dr. Amaral and I have spoken about because, again, as you probably know, as an early childhood educator, that's something that we know that students are really able to kind of sponge that up. So that is something we've talked about. Where's Gina? Yeah, we've talked to. So, yes. You know, it's okay. I can just kind of brief all of the videos because I don't want to waste anybody's time on this evening. Um, so essentially what the video is talking about is the modes of communication that we're using for languages are interpersonal, presentational, and interpretive modes. And so we're focusing on those modes of communications for our students to actually speak the language, as opposed to just memorize the vocabulary and then using it in a setting that wouldn't really be natural. So the competency around language is, I can communicate effectively with students and family members and my community, um, and I seek opportunities to do so. And so that's part of this global studies, global competency that we're really trying to move forward in Parkway, and it has also been something that came out of our listening tours um, two years last year um, that Dr. Marty and Dr. Kutumper led. So um, again, that's something that we're going toward. We can just go ahead and skip to the next slide. Okay, no worries. Thank you. So 
just something to be said along with that. So this year, the teachers worked cross language, so that is also best practice, and that's something that we shifted from a single language team to a cross language team. And so as we add on Mandarin next year, virtually, Parker, we're very excited about that. We're also looking to expand ASL potentially to our high schools and really looking at what a blended learning model for acquiring language looks like and if it is it possible. Um, so one of the things that I'm actually going to be doing this year to help try to figure that out is I'm going to be auditing Mandarin um, as a coordinator to try to figure out if I can learn it too and what are the ins and outs of that because I think that that would be good for our teachers to know. And just a couple highlights about the level one curriculum. Again, best practice indicates authentic material. So before when we had a textbook that was not authentic, it was written by not necessarily an authentic text around, for instance, like an infographic that's actually from Spain or from Tunisia for French or from you know another country. So we're using authentic materials. Um, we're looking at 90% in the target language. And then also it, the idea of fewer topics, so less content, but deeper into those topics. And again, because that's around the communication. And this has been really a concerted effort. If you get to bump into a language teacher, please tell them thank you so much for their hard work. This has been a shift in their thinking, and it really was a grassroots organization from the inside the teachers that they really wanted to do this. And the results that we're seeing for our students in competency for speaking the language has increased, and we're going to be testing that next year as well with speaking and written assessments. So um, I just want to thank you all for your support. Thank you, Dr. Marty and Dr. Meredith. Um, this year, as we went through the transition, I really appreciate it. It's been, it's been a great experience, and we're, we are now writing level two next year and level three thematically, and we'll continue that. So. So good question. We are offering Mandarin one virtually, so students from all of the five high schools are able to enroll in that, and I'll be bringing Mandarin two to virtual course proposal this upcoming fall, so that those students have another pathway to go into. And I think the hope is, you know, depending on student enrollment and what the interest is for students, that we would investigate looking at that face to face, depending on what the enrollment is of students. Do students take more than one language? Absolutely. So I was in Italy with our Latin teachers over spring break, and one of the students that I met who was sitting next to me on the bus was chatting. He just finished German four, and next year he's taking German five and Mandarin. So we do have some linguists. We also have some students that study at the Missouri Tamil School that are in our community, and they are fluent in their language as a part of their culture. They're also fluent in English, and then they're taking a third language here in Parkway. So trilingualism is something that is coming as well. Sure. What's in demand right now? So uh, nationwide, language is actually on, language learning is on the decrease, and the, the research behind that is because people can learn Duolingo 15 minutes at night when they go to bed, you know, et cetera. So in terms of languages, Spanish has remained steady, has slightly increased, Mandarin is increasing, Arabic, French, German, and Latin are on the decline. We see that in French and German in our high schools, however, Latin has actually increased, and I think that's... I would make the assumption to say that that's because we have a community that supports that for pre-professional degrees and um, we have students that are interested in taking that, so we continue on for those. Are you still seeing the requirement from a lot of colleges and universities to have two years of language before, to, to graduate to go on to colleges and universities? So I think one thing that I've seen in working with CTE and MCL is that some colleges are actually accepting science as the language because some states actually, 14 states um, in the United States offer computer science as a language for their high school graduation. Missouri is not one of those. So I think that some universities are still looking for that two years of language. However, in talking with Aaron Schulte about a month ago, if students take, let's say, seventh and eighth grade and then they go and take level, and they didn't take it for the high school credit, but they take the level two, the college will still acknowledge and recognize that they, in fact, did have the two years of the language, even though it wasn't transcripted in the middle school, if that makes sense. So if they don't think that they're ready to take the high school credit in seventh and eighth grade, then they can still get honored it if they passed it with their, you know, on their final. So just a follow-up question sure. on the computer language. Yeah. Are you planning to have some kind of even a basic SQL, you know, SQL as a structure query language uh, for the computer level? So just, just wonder. 
So are we, the question is, are we looking at SQL? So one of the things that we did last week at the design challenge that I think that Ms. Hopper mentioned is we brought together a team that involved our STEM coordinators, so Stephanie Valley, Jimmy Profit, Jason Brooks, Phil, Jennifer Stanfill, and we are looking at how we can continue to expand computer science offerings. One thing I will note is that not this year, but the year before, I ran a computer science advisory in our community, and what industry told us, 20 representatives said, doesn't matter what language they know, we can teach them how to do any language, Ruby, JavaScript, you know, iOS, with whatever it is, they have to be problem solvers, they have to be critical thinkers, they have to have those skills, and if you can teach them that. So part of our design challenge last week we met about was how do we continue to offer students choice in learning of computer science, and if it is that language, what do we need to do to provide potentially a workshop model for the teachers to embed in their classes? We are piloting a class next year at South High called Computer Science App Design and Development, and that course is written competency-based, so that if there was a student that was interested in that, we could support that learning. Sure. Other questions? I was a French major in college. You were? And what was your high school? French, Hebrew, and Spanish, all three. But what I want to tell you is when my son was in seventh grade and he had the choice of French, German, or Spanish, he's a smart kid. He chose French because he thought, oh, I've got a homework helper. Well, we sat down together one time. <laughs> and when I realized that he had not been taught to pronounce a word, not one single word, I couldn't sit down with him anymore. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't take it. So I applaud what we're doing in um, in the spoken language, because I guarantee you that our children are not going to grow up to go read something somewhere. They're going to grow up to go speak to somebody, and that's really what they need to learn. So, yeah, if they're naturally curious, they want to go law to do that, and I think you're totally right. So, thank you for your support. Again, I do really appreciate it. We have some awesome teachers that are leading the work. So, thank you. I would like to go back to uh, Christy's question. Oh, sure. About the elementary, and I mean, I think most of us would love to see that design. It's a matter of time. I mean, we have so much to try to do in the elementary day, but the approach you're taking right now could transfer in some fashion to be embedded or integrated, correct? Yes, I, I would agree with that, Dr. Lawrence, absolutely right. Uh, but it's, uh, we want to do it in a quality manner and, and, and to be, to, you know, be consistent with the, what Amy's talking about. That's really developing language in, in the right sort of way, not uh, sometimes when a language is offered, it's, it's around numbers and colors. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but so we really want to do it so it's, it's got more of a, an approach that will be similar to what you're about to Absolutely. Correct. Yes, you are exactly right. Uh, I'm not the expert. No, you you are you, you listen to a lot of things I've told you about this, so I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Great, thank you. Thank you. We have a motion and a second that the Board of Education approve the revised curriculum framework unit overview from stage one for French, German and Spanish of the modern classical language curriculum for implementation in 2017-2018 school year. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries 5-0. 13.0, there is a policy review tonight in 14.01 library, library media program evaluation. Go back, come on down. Thank you. Good evening, President Feldman, Dr. Marty, members of the board, Ms. Silver. I am really excited to be here tonight to share with you our findings of the library media program evaluation. We've been working on this for almost a year now, and um, we, it's been very insightful, it's been very revealing, and it, the reflective nature of program evaluation has really given me a lot to think about and really help, I think, direct the library program as we go forward. Before we get started, I could turn this on. Before we get started, I want to just say thank you to uh, the members of the board, Dr. Marty, uh, Dr. Meredith, Dr. Tyson for uh, guiding me through this, all the members of the teaching, learning, and accountability team, as well as Kim Linsbo. Without your support, I would not have been able to essentially make it up here to before you tonight. Um, additionally, I want to thank the 
library committee. We had eight librarians who gave up their time to come together and really think and analyze and look at data, as well as design what we, where we want to go in the future. And so tonight I want to start with the mission statement. And the mission statement in the library program really resonates with us because of the four C's and that last piece about understanding and responding to challenges of an ever-changing world. As we go through tonight, I think that you're going to hear a lot of the broad scope and the broad influence that the library program has upon our schools and in our buildings. And as we think about the future, um, that ever-changing world continues to challenge us and continues to give us opportunities to really make Parkway and the schools in Parkway a magical place for kids as they work through and solve problems and ask problems as well as go back and learn those literacy skills that are so important for them going forward. So as you think about the librarians that you have um, encountered over your time, what I would encourage you to think about is the way that librarians are looked at across around the world. This is actually a, an advertisement from a European automaker saying that this car is not suitable for librarians. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what is not suitable. I don't know if it's a powerful engine. I don't know if it's the look. I don't, it might be a sports star. I'm not really sure. Um, but this was, there's a, there's a kind of a stigma. And that has a lot to do with the background of, and maybe the experiences that you had in libraries in your past. Um, there is actually a librarian named Nancy Pearl, who has her own librarian action figure. And I know it's not really easy to see, but on that, on that sheet, she has amazing push button shushing action. <laughs> and so as you think about the library program, this is actually a real person. Nancy Pearl lives in Portland, Oregon, and she um, has fully embraced her shushing action and action figure. And this was given to me right after I took this position. And um, it kind of resonates with me because it, it indicates for me the things that we're not looking for in libraries. We're not looking for librarians who are going to shush kids. We want them to be active. We want them to explore. But we also want them to be able to understand how to use information and find information. So one of the questions that we always ask our librarians is, what does it mean to be a librarian in the digital age? We are fully into that 21st century. 2017 is not a time where we can look back and shush kids around them trying to explore and figure out how to use information. And this is that essential question that we consistently go back to. In fact, we have, a few years ago, we created a established a, a vision statement for our library program. And as you look at this, there are a number of elements in there that are going to tie back into our mission statement, as well as, as you listen through the rest of the night, you're going, I think you're going to hear um, a lot of these things come up over time. So, first of all, they're engaging with students. They're making sense of ideas and information, using the library curriculum to respond to the needs of our community providing opportunities for exploration, learning, and creation, all while fostering love of reading. Now, that's a lot of stuff. And there's a lot of stuff that librarians are asked to do every day. And all of those pieces really combine to come to the library program. And as we think about what has happened, in 2009, we came back. That was the last time we did a program evaluation of our library program. And so in 2009, I want to give you some highlights of the things that have happened since then. We have established and maintained a library curriculum where before there was none. We've established a library program at Fern Ridge. There was not a library program at Fern Ridge five years ago. Um, that has, we now have a library and a library program going on there. We have adopted a modern library catalog to give kids access to resources and digital age content. We have partnered with the county library to provide library cards for all Parkway students. Again, to give them access to information and really be able to experience that information in different ways. We've been highlighted the National Ed Tech Plan and we have established a nationally recognized mobile makerspace program. Each one of these things offer different components to that library program. And so since 2009, these are some of the highlights that we've done. Now, as I talk tonight, there are three elements of the library program that I really want you to kind of be thinking about, have in your mind. First of all is the place, and the place is simply the space of the library program in our schools. 
The second one is programming, and this is what happens in those library programs. This is what we ask kids to do, and this is the opportunities that we give them to experience content in various ways. And finally is the professional, and the professional is the librarian who designs those programs in order to take place in that space. And all three of those together really give us a sense of what a library program is going to look like. So in January, I came before you and I talked about the five things that we wanted to study, that being the role of the librarian, digital strategies for content, student choice and personalization, where librarians fit in there, as well as the flexible program to meet kids' needs in our libraries, and literacy advocacy for all the types of literacy that are so important now, from information and media. Library collaboration. Library and teachers 
collab collaborate all the time. They work on lessons together. And one of the pieces that's interesting about the library program is that it provides teachers with a lot of professional development. Teachers look to librarians as innovators and as a place where they can find out about new technologies, how to use those technologies. And so teachers are providing, or librarians are providing professional development to teachers on many different topics over the year. And not just around technology, but around literacy instruction, around what materials to select, and what kind of information they want to use in their classrooms. Our third topic, our third key finding, is that we have outdated library spaces as a district. Now, we have gone through great lengths at some of our schools. West High has a beautiful library. They just read it. Red Hollow has an amazing elementary library. But by and large, across the district, we saw that teachers, students, librarians, and administrators all felt like our spaces were outdated. And what they, it came up more than once that possible bond issue could be another, the library, and the library is on a, not library, Library is on a possible future bond issue, maybe an avenue, so that it's not dependent upon um, a PTO like what we saw at both Rain Hollow and uh, West High. We also, for our fourth one, we also recognize that communication across our district for things other than books in our library, what other programming is available. That can clear through parents, teachers, and administrators, as well as students. Now, we, we talk a lot through the library program about the information that we have, but we also need to talk about our other offerings. And that comes from the district level as well as individual buildings. Our fifth key finding that is that we have, this is really a celebration, we have an amazing amount of content in our libraries. We have access, and part of that is through digital content, through our partnership with the St. Louis County Library, but what we still need is we need more uh, options for pleasure reading, and we need to be more intentional about social justice issues and getting content in there that will give kids opportunities to explore those. Now, we already actually have those, that content. We just haven't identified it in that way inside of our catalog, um, and that one of the things that came out of this was that intentionality around that would be a good idea. For our sixth key finding, this has to do with library and professional development. And one of the things that we found is that because of the changing nature of technology specifically, and the changing nature of instructional practice, librarians need to have that continued just-in-time professional development. And so that, so that they can serve their buildings in a variety of different ways. We also found that our library evaluation is currently not representative of what we are asking librarians to do. And that is from not just the programming tasks, but the administrative tasks as well. Librarians truly run a small business inside of their building, and so they need, they're in charge of inventory, ordering, budget, all those pieces. And those are pieces that they are struggling to find balance between supporting teachers, having time to support teachers, at teachers' point of view, supporting students, as well as doing these administrative tasks. The eighth one has to do with digital content, and we found that we have a lot of digital content, except that our students are only using it for school And so it's really expanding that and trying to market some of that and give them different opportunities to experience some of that content. Um, that's, that's one of the things we, need to, that we know that we need to work on. We also found that libraries are innovative spaces. Teachers and students go to libraries and seek out the library in order to help them with whatever they are looking to do. And not because they are the expert in that, but because they are able, they have, um, that is part of their role in the building. And they have the wherewithal to, the, and the, technology, the technical knowledge in order to go about working through those things. And then finally, we have the um, idea that librarians support students and teachers in a variety of different ways. Specifically, they support them in critical thinking, digital citizenship, research, and literacy skills. So all of those literacy skills that we talked about earlier, each one of those becomes an important piece. Now, when I came up here, I gave you a summary sheet of the recommendations that we uh, plan to give. It is also linked up there on, in that URL. And I'm just going to, again, summarize each of these topics because there's an awful lot of stuff there. But I really want to kind of sh showcase the different things that are important as a part of that.
So we have five topics of recommendations for our program. The first one is advocacy, and I will go through each of these. First one is advocacy. Second is responsiveness to community, instruction and programming, educational leadership, and professional development, as well as those library spaces. To get started, I want to talk about advocacy. And as we talk about advocacy, think about this not in terms of it is certainly advocating for students and advocating for the programming that they need, but it also has to do with that clear communication of the role of librarians. Librarians do a somewhat poor job of advocating for themselves, truly, um, and, and really letting people know. And that goes back to that communication. So as we think about this, there are multiple avenues for communication. We need to continue to think about equity of access to both print and digital materials. We've come a long way with that, but we have to continue to push forward. We need to talk about equity of experience with digital tools and materials. Right now, it is very dependent on which teacher a student has as to what their experience is going to be in technology. And that's not just in Parkway. That is, what we found is that is nationwide. Teachers who are into technology, their kids have experiences. What library, one of the roles of librarians is to really um, advocate for student use of technology in the classroom. And then finally, as a district, we need to outline what the role of the library is in the digital age. Moving on to the second uh, key, to the second topic of recommendation, it has to do with that responsiveness to the community. And when we think about responsiveness to the community, what I like to think about is that we are responsive because we have our finger on the pulse of what's going on in that building. We know what our kids need, we know what our teachers need, we know what our administrator needs, and we know what our parents need as they come in and they are working and looking for opportunities to help their kids. So that can be done in a lot of different ways through the CSIP, through budget, advocating for student privacy is a big topic now, scheduling and using flexible scheduling to give kids opportunities to use, to come in at their point of need, as well as developing our print and digital collections so they can access them outside of the school day, and finding that intentional time for administrative tasks so that librarians can be available when they are able for, uh, for students and teachers. Our third topic is um, instruction and programming, and that instruction and programming, what we are really discussing has to do with every decision that we make in the library program has to support classroom instruction. And that support of classroom instruction helps us provide that relevant programming. So we need to continue to evaluate and update our curriculum, as well as really discover and explore opportunities to give kids experiences around creativity, exploration, and discovery. And there's lots of ways that we can do that. Um, but th those are just some of the topics that are in there. Our fourth topic is around educational leadership and professional development. I've already said that our librarians are seen as developers. They are seen as instructional leaders. And so what we are looking for them to do, our librarians, this is an action item for them, is to look and seek out opportunities to be leaders in their building. And not just in their building, but at the district level, at the regional and state level, as well as at the national level, and lead through our library program to showcase not what, just what we're doing, but what library programs can be um, for, for libraries around the country. So that gets to provide ongoing support for our teachers as well as seeking those opportunities for leadership. Our last one has to do with those uh, library physical spaces. And really what this is about is it's about making modern library spaces and creating opportunities for multi-use spaces. Now, what that may mean is that we have a quiet area over here. We have a collaboration area over here. We have a creation area over here. But each one of those areas is all housed in that same space and gives kids multiple opportunities when they come into the library to experience the library in a variety of different ways. These five program recommendations are really topics that have a lot of stuff underneath them. And I think that speaks to the nature of the librarian and the influence that they have on their building. Which leads me right back to what does it mean to be a librarian in the digital age? And it means lots of things, and truly we don't have an answer for this. Because the digital age is always changing and we are always, it's a moving target. But we're closer to an answer. We have discussion points, we have topics that we can really rally around. Which brings us back to Nancy Pearl and her amazing shushing action. And with that shushing action, this is not the librarian of the future in Parkway. This is not the librarian that we're looking for. This is not the library program that we're looking for. What we are looking for is that place, programming, and professional to bring all those pieces together to really give kids opportunities to experience the library in different ways, to experience school in different ways, and to 
really think about all the school has to offer. So through these recommendations, we feel as though that this will help us to continue to move our library program forward, um, to give kids relevant experiences inside of our schools, as well as help them make good decisions when they walk out our doors. So through this, we feel as though we are going to be continue to be a leader both locally and nationally through our library program. And with that, I would love to answer. So right now, I don't have exact numbers, but we are really heavy on paper. And part of the reason that we're really heavy on paper is because we haven't been able to ensure access for all kids through digital devices at this point. So as we move into our um, off program, our access learning for tech today with um, Chromebooks, that is giving more of that, and that is becoming the digital content has to be one of those strategies. So we are really heavy. I would say we are probably 80%. 20% if I just had to guess, 80% paper. And is there a good demand for uh, paper? I mean, you know, what's the demand? So right now, because of access, there's a huge demand for paper. Um, and, and really, that's, that's, where we have, that's where we have been. That is changing, though. And what we are seeing is, especially as students who are young have experiences with digital content, as they are rising in the grade level, we are seeing them um, not shy away from paper, but incorporate paper and digital as one and be able to move back and forth between them. And truly, that's what we want. We want them to be able to choose the medium that best works for them, whether it is paper or digital. And we're doing a lot of work in that through through the ALT program as well as through just our classrooms as we, as we use more digital content as a whole. But library books right now, we are still very paper-based. Protecting your own identity, don't share your password with other people. 
Like those are the kind of topics that librarians are doing lessons on, and they're going into schools and doing lessons. They're going, sorry, classrooms and doing lessons there. Um, Southwest Middle was one of the schools that recently, on one of our late start days, the entire day after that late start was a digital citizenship day, and they went through and they really made an intentional effort. As we have been working with Chromebooks and putting Chrome, more Chromebooks in the classrooms, that is becoming more a part of the conversation. And one of the approaches that we're taking is to have teachers, to empower teachers to share their digital lives with students. And what I mean by that is not to, you know, like friend everybody on Facebook. What I mean by that is that they talk through the decisions that they're making as adults. So even as they are up in front of a board and they're doing a search, why are they going through and why are they making the decisions they make around what words they're using to search, as well as how they manage their own profile online. And it doesn't, it's not a whole lesson, it's just part of the conversation, part of what's going on in the classroom. Okay. Sorry. Um, if you had all the money in the world, what type of physical changes would you make to our library spaces? So I think that kind of like I was talking about, having those multiple zones inside of our library, I don't, I don't think we need to, um, part of, one of the problems that's going on right now is because of, for instance, at McKelvey, for example, their library actually um, shrunk this year because they had to put a classroom in it. And, and that's okay, um, but that means that that zone, that area for kids to explore is no longer there. And that's happening, that's happening in other places too, not quite as dramatic as that. Most of the time it's temporary. But as we think about um, the, the types of experiences we want to give kids in the library, we want to have flexible seating so that that seating can move. One of the biggest things we hear from kids is they want soft seating. Um, I would look at, there are a lot of different models. We have one of a, an award-winning city library in St. Louis that is amazing, that was redone a number of years ago that is around that model. And that has been, um, they have different spaces for different things. So that's what I would do. It's, this, it's the city library right downtown, um, right across from the memorial. Um, I don't remember what, Soldier Memorial? It's right across from Soldier Memorial. It's, if you go in it, it's beautiful. And they have done an amazing job of mixing the traditional library with a modern feel of it and creating multiple types of spaces so I truly think we need a creativity space. We need an opportunity for kids to create. We need a space to do that maker space stuff that we're doing right now. And we also still need that quiet space where kids can work and read and um, ex you know, kind of explore content personally as opposed to collaboratively. So how are we doing it? Um, breaking down, you talked earlier about the elementary, you know, on set period uh, time. There are some changes in the elementary. There are, there are changes that are occurring, There's, um, and, and it really depends on school. Um, we go back and forth between having fixed schedules and flexible schedules for librarians, and it really depends on each school. Um, and, and what it depends on in a lot of cases are things like lunch duty and um, that, that are pulling librarians out of the library, things like um, coverage for kindergarten and, and primary grades specifically, where they are the release time for those grades, which also means that when a librarian is doing lessons around information literacy or media literacy or something like that, then they don't have the, the teacher doesn't have the opportunity to hear that too, and that's an influence point that we may intentionally like miss. So yes, we're making progress. Um, we still have we still have a long way to go. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you.